helps um, white, is fucking nasty, is a uh, universiteitsprofessor aan de uh, Vrije Universiteit uh, Brussel, of de, ofwel de ULB in het Frans. Um, ik, hij is daar, uh, geeft daar les in um, uh, interne geneeskunde, derma, dermatologie, dat is van de huid, en, en allergologie. Dus uh, de perfect geknipte persoon om ons te komen vertellen hoe, hoe de wetten van de kerk goed zijn voor ons lichaam. Dat is een interessant thema, vind ik zelf, met de wassen en de kerk. Dus uh, daar wil ik dan dus dadelijk mee over. Ik geef het woord aan uh, meneer Verwijt. De vragen kunnen we op het einde, is er ruimte genoeg om ook vragen te stellen over wat u voogd heeft. U kan die noteren in het volgende stuk. En wens u het Goeiedag. Allereerst wil ik de organisatoren van deze conferentie bedanken voor hun uitnodiging. Ten tweede wil ik mijn excuses aanbieden voor mijn arme Nederlands. Ik ben van plan binnenkort met lessen te beginnen. Ik hoop dat jullie me kunnen begrijpen en dat mijn Nederlands niet te Duits of te Engels is. Laten we zien. Oké. Okay. Ja, we weten allemaal dat de Heilige Kerk goed is voor onze ziel. Daarom zijn we hier. Maar ik denk dat de Kerk ook goed is voor de gezondheid en ik hoop jullie allemaal te overtuigen. Ik zal enkele voorbeelden gebruiken zoals voeding, keusheid en geestelijke gezondheid. Maar te beginnen, wie ben ik? Zoals jullie kunnen horen, ben ik Engels. Ik ben geboren in Noordwest-Engeland, het meest katholieke deel uh, van Engeland. Het ligt niet ver van uh, een prachtig gebied van meren en heuvels, waar veel dichters woonden. Uh, William Wordsworth, Ruskin enzovoort. Prachtig gebied. Ik heb drie jaar geneeskunde gestudeerd in Manchester in Noordwest-Engeland, en dan studeerde nog eens drie jaar in het Zaland in Duitsland, en ook in Wenen in Oostenrijk. Dus kan ik vloeiend Duits spreken, maar helaas niet zo goed in Nederland. Daarna werkte ik als arts in Londen en Hannover, maar nu aan de Franstalige Vrije Universiteit Brussel, en ook deeltijd in Londen en aan de wereld Wereldgezondheidsorganisatie in Genève. Ik leerde de oude mis, heilige mis kennen toen ik 18 jaar oud was. Ik ben met een Franse vrouw getrouwd en we hebben tien kinderen. <applaus> Dank je. <applaus> Zoals jullie op de achtergrond van de foto uh, kunnen zien, wonen we in het heuvelachtige deel van Brussel. <lacht> Prachtig, ja. Oké. Okay. Voeding is een belangrijk aspect van het leven. Wat zegt de Heilige Kerk hierover? Sinds de vroegste dagen uh, beveelt de Kerk tijden van vasten en feesten aan. Dit is om de geest op gebed te concentreren. Maar het vasten en onthouding van vlees kan ook goede effecten op ons lichaam hebben. Goed. Dat is in het uh, oude Nederlands, het vlees en, enzovoort. Ja. Goed. Obesitas kan vreselijke schade aanrichten. We weten allemaal dat ouderdomsuiker kan worden veroorzaakt door een slecht dieet. Ik heb ook kinderen van 10 of 11 jaar zien met ouderdomsuiker bij zwaarlijvigheid. Dat is ja ongelooflijk. Dit komt helaas steeds vaker voor in Engeland, België en Nederland. Wat kan vasten bereiken? Men kan de kans op suikerziekte verminderen en over het algemeen jullie gezondheid verbeteren. Kanker van de baarmoeder wordt bijvoorbeeld vaak gezien bij vrouwen met overgewicht. Ons wordt verteld dat minder eten misschien beter is voor het milieu. Ik ben geen expert. 
Okay, was sagt der Wetenschaft über das eucharistische Fasten? Tot die Jahre 1950, was hat eucharistische Fasten von der Mitternacht? Pius XII. stand in drei Uhr Fasten zu, als hat Mitternachtfasten nicht möglich war. Paulus VI. introduzierte ein ein Uhr Fasten vor der Heiligen Kommunie. Das betekent mal äh, 15 bis 30 Minuten vor der Heiligen Miss. Ist das wel Fasten? Laten wir sehen. Gut, in dieser Studie sehen wir, dass 60 Minuten nach dem Eten das Leichmachen von der Mach noch mal nicht ist begonnen. Drei Uhr auf mehr nach dem Eten ist der Mach helemal leich. Nochmals, das traditionelle Weten von der Kirche sein korrekt, selbst in der Wetenschaft. Der Heilige Kirk will, dass wir uns beschreiten kleiden. Diese Regeln seien noch stets geldig, selbst als sie wurden genegiert. Sorry, dass ich dieses Zitat nicht in het Nederlands kann finden. If a certain kind of dress constitutes a grave and proximate occasion of sin and endangers the salvation of your soul and others, it is your duty to give it up. Das ist ja klar. Heil nou sluitende kleding is ook om ontwijkt te worden, net zoals Kardinal Siri in 1960. Ik zie uh, nu veel houtkanker als gevolg van ongepaste kleding. Bijvoorbeeld melanoom, hier rechts, wat ook kan doden. Melanom is de hoogste oorzaak van sterfgevallen door kanker in die tussen 20 tot 30 jaar in het Verenigd Koninkrijk. Dat is heel slecht. Dit is hetzelfde voor plaviselcellcarcinoom, hier rechts, en ook basaalcellcarcinoom. Basaalcellcarcinoom is de meest voorkomende vorm van, van de kanker ter wereld. Houtkanker wordt de meest voorkomende kanker die we zien in België en Nederland. En de trend gaat omhoog. Bescherming tegen overmatige blootstelling aan de zon is van groot belang. Beschermen is beter dan antizonnenbrandmiddel. Dus volg de regels van de Heilige Kerk. De oplossing is zich om bescheiden te kleden. Hebben jullie van deze website gehoord? Femme à part? Mijn vrouw en dochter zijn geweldige fans. Het is helaas alleen maar in het Frans. En ik wacht op de herrenversie. <laughs> Oké, okay. de traditionele leer van de Heilige Kerk is gemakkelijk te begrijpen. Geen seksueel contact buiten het huwelijk. Degenen die de kerk niet gehoorzamen, leiden geestelijk naar misschien ook... Lichamelijk. Kijk hier rechts. Hoe meer seksuele partners men heeft, hoe hoger het risico op seksueel overdraagbare aandoeningen. Dat is 15 of meer partners daar rechts in de groen, groene kleur. 500 Duizend nieuwe gevallen, chlamydia, pro jaar in Europa. Dat is wel een epidemie. Kanker kan het gevolg zijn van seksueel verworven vratten. Afrika leidt het meest aan kankergerelateerde sterfgevallen. Deze kanker kan leiden tot onvruchtbaarheid en natuurlijk de dood. Dit zijn de redenen voor een christelijk huwelijk. Dus geen voorafgaand samenleven, geen onnodige vertragingen bij het vertrouwen en geen kunstmatige anticonceptie. Degenen die voor het huwelijk samenwonen, hebben een grotere kans om te scheiden. Veel studies tonen hetzelfde effect in verschillende landen. Uh, Noorwegen, 
Enkeland und so fort. Unsere Regierungen befordern äh, Scheiden, aber auch hat Lathra Hüvelig. Man dit kann leiden, tot Problemen um zwanger zu werden. Das ist keine gute Idee in unserer verkreisenden Bevölkerung. Ja, bei 50 ist es ja, nicht mehr möglich. Beinahe nicht. Sommige Patienten vertellen mir, dass sie künstliche Antikonzepte haben gebraucht, Abortusen haben gehabt und nu reagieren bei Befruchtung willen. Ob der Lebenszeit von 45 auf 50, allemal betalt durch unsere Belastungen. Künstliche Antikonzepte können Siegtes verursachen. Ich habe eine Dame behandelt, die ob derartige jährige Lebenszeit ein Berührter hat durch die Pill. Aber wir können auch sehen äh, Allergien, das sehe ich oft, äh, vag. Aber auch äh, Kanker, misschien. Und auch Thrombosen, die auch doden, äh, können doden. Post-Abortus-Stress-Syndrom ist kontroversiell. Mein eigen Meinung ist, dass sommige Frauen helas geen tekenen van spijt vertonen na een abortus. Maar ik heb ook vaak gezien dat sommige vrouwen diep lijden. We kunnen er niet op vertrouwen dat onze regeringen en universiteiten ons de waarheid hierover vertellen, helaas. Het onderwijs van de kerk uh, over opvoeding is praktisch en verstandig. So viele Kinder an Gott zu geben, sonder der Gesundheit von der Mutter zu schaden, auf das Gesinn verheit zu lassen gehen, ja natürlich. Steviger, aber ehrlicher Abfuding, verstandiger Hierarchie. Viele Studien tonen an, dass größere Gesinnen eine lachere Kanz haben auf psychische Andunungen. Ähm, ja, das ist recht, aber äh, auch Freitagabends dann <lacht> in meinem Fall mein Gesinn ist ja so ein bisschen äh, äh, moeilijk. Aber ja, die Studis ja, tun das. Schwarze Kinder in London tun das Unterweis minder gut als schwarze Kinder in das Karibis-Gebiet. Warum? Zum Ersten ist er minder Disziplin auf London zu schulen dann in der karibischen Schule. Den zweiten haben die Kinder in London minder wach ein Vater teils. Umgekehrt haben zwei Kinder in England, die schlagen in das Unterweis, wacke zwei unterstöhnende Alters und eine gute Disziplin auf der Schule. Ja. Katholik Unterweis wurde allem gepriesen, selbst soms in liberalen Kringen, so als The Guardian, äh, hier in Engelse Kranz. Natürlich bewundern sie unser Altruismus, aber auch äh, achieve higher examination results, immeasurable benefit of a Catholic education. Das ist ja gewaltig. Aber bestaat der Katholik Unterweis mehr? Das ist die Frage. Dieser engelse Biskop von mal 21.000 praktizierenden Katholiken steht nicht bekannt als konservativ. Aber er hey sagte in 2012, dass sogenannte katholische Schulen helemaal nicht katholisch seien. In which the majority of pupils and sometimes teachers are not practicing Catholics. Is it time for us to admit that we can no longer maintain schools that are Catholic in name only? Maar wat kunnen wij doen? Ja, de oplossing is echt katholieke scholen. Scholen zoals deze, l'école de la Sainte Espérance in Brussel, le Herri la Vieille Ville, Comblain Beach, Schönenberg and so fort. That is the oplossing, volgens mij. Geestelijke gezondheid is een enorm probleem voor de volksgezondheid. Van de landen die in welvaart leven, heeft België het hoogste aantal zelfsmoorden. 
De trend in Benelux gaat omhoog. En het is in Rusland en uh, Hongarije uh, nog sle slechter. 50% van de mensen zal op enig moment in hun leven aan een psychische aandoening leiden. Verschillende studies tonen aan dat biechten de kans op depressie en zelfmoord kan verminderen. Dan kunnen we daarna uh, uh, bij biechten gaan. Onze regering denkt dat meer pillen en meer abortussen en vooral allem meer belastingen zullen helpen. Maar ik ben helemaal niet met uh, hun uh, eens. Een oude psychiater vertelde mij ooit dat wanneer katholieken vroeger gingen biechten, ze hem niet nodig hadden. Buiten onze kringen spreekt bijna niemand meer over biechten gaan. Toen ik in Duitsland woonde, vond ik het bijna onmogelijk te biechten. De moderne priesten wilden het niet. Ze ontmoedigden meer ervan. Biechten zal niet alle psychiatrische ziektes genezen, maar kan soms wel helpen. De kerk heeft ons geestelijk altijd op de dood voorbereid, maar heeft ook voor ons aardse lichamen gezorgd. Nonnen en monniken zijn allang artsen en verpleegkundigen van terminaal ziekten. Leonard Cheshire, hier de Britse soldaat, stichtte de hospicebeweging in Engeland na het Tweede Wereldoorlog uh, om de leemte op te vullen uh, die werd achtergelaten door de afwezigheid van kloosters. Euthanasie in Engeland is officieel verboden. Officieel. Ik was geschrokken en bedroefd dat het veel gebeurt in Nederland en België. Na, na mijn ervaring in Engeland voelen veel mensen verplicht om te sterven, omdat ze zich ongewenst voelen. Je ziet hier 2000 zielen in België, 6000 zielen in Nederland. Dat is ja. Ook bij psychisch leven, ook zonder wilsverklaring. En ook misschien euthanasie tegen de wil van de stervende. De stervende wil dat niet, niet uh, aan het einde. How, hoe ver we verwijderd zijn van de eed van Hippocrates. De hele roeping van de geneeskunde is nu op omgekeerd. Dat is een reden waarom ik ervoor heb gekozen om dermatologie en allergologie te oefenen. Ik zal mijn best nooit iemand kwaad doen. Nooit zal ik een dodelijk middel voorschrijven. Nooit zal ik een vrouw een instrument voorschrijven om een miskram in een bortus op te wekken. Dat kan men niet meer maken, Hippocrates. Dat gaat niet meer, helaas. Oké, okay. de conclusies van deze presentatie zijn hier. De wetten van de kerk zijn primair voor onze ziel. Maar indirect bevorderen ze de gezondheid. Bovenal steunen onze priesters, miscentren en scholen. Ons lichaam heeft ze nodig, evenals onze ziel. En opgelet, de meningen in deze presentatie zijn helaas niet de meningen van mijn universiteit. En dat mag ik niet zo in de universiteit zeggen. Net zoals mijn vriend uh, professor Mercier. Goed. Dank je voor je aandacht. Nog vragen? In, uh, ik, ik, ik zal mijn best uh, doen uh, in het Nederlands te beantwoorden, maar uh, misschien ook in het Engels. Ja? Ja, dat is niet klaar. Uh, waarom? Uh, misschien ook de, de 
der eine stöhnen der anderen, das kann, kann auch sein. Aber auch in großer Familie ist mich in zwei Autos da. Und das ist äh, belangreich für die Kinder. Das sieht man auch in der in Herrn Siegenhaus. Äh, nur äh, äh, noch eine e ein Mutter, dann hat das nicht so. Ja, hey, das kommt, man kann, um, we can't do anything else about it, but, you know, if it happens, then you have to deal with it, and it's not the children's fault, but there are se severe discipline problems with the absence of a father in London, particularly, and I, when the children come in to see me, I can often tell that, you know, they, there's no father influence at home, that's the problem. Oh, mm. well, not well, yeah, I'm not a psychiatrist, but, um, you know, I think mental health, there are different factors why people get mental health problems. Firstly, there is a genetic component to it. Secondly, there are environmental factors. But there is no doubt that family breakdown is a major influence on mental health. So um, suicide attempts, depression, anxiety... And um, it's amazing, really, when you ask patients who are on antidepressants and who've maybe tried to commit suicide, you know, and, and then they tell you, oh, broken family, I've never got over my parents' divorce, and, you know, it's very sad. So, of course, our governments are promoting d broken families. It's everything that they do is promotes broken families. And this has a huge effect on children's lives. And we know from the transgender debate, which I haven't talked about, that our universities and governments are not interested in the truth in science. They're interested in their own political ends, sadly. So we will never hear the truth about broken families. But psychiatrists who are honest, even the ones who are not Christian or Catholic or anything, will, will tell you, you know, broken families, you know, it's, it's another stress, it's another reason why people can, be, can become ill, both physically or mentally. Yeah, ich bin Helma mit uh, U1. Uh, I'm going to go back to this slide from before. Yeah, so this is about uh, sexually transmitted warts, Warten, and the risk of cancer of the cervix, and also for men, men's genital cancer as well. So there's definitely a strong risk uh, with this. And unfortunately, when you treat the warts, the risk doesn't go away because the wart virus lives in the skin for many, many years, and some of the types then cause cancer in the long term. Unfortunately, as always, our governments are very selective. They may have admitted that there is this connection, but their solution is to give more, um, more uh, uh, contraceptives, so more... Uh, preservatives, let's say, so to, to uh, reduce this risk. But actually, those contraceptives do not completely take away the risk of getting these warts and getting this cancer later. So, of course, now there is the move to vaccinate uh, girls and now maybe boys as well. In Australia, all young people get vaccinated against these warts. But there is just one other thing to mention about this, because... Of course, uh, 
you might have a woman who marries a man and she is following all the rules of the church, but maybe the man before they got married didn't always follow the rules of the church. And of course, then he might give this to the woman. So, of course, it's not a direct consequence of the sin, really. You can be completely innocent and get these things anyway. Um, but as I say, they are, governments always take the wrong message. Instead of promoting abstinence before marriage, they're pro promoting contraceptives, which ultimately, and there are some studies have shown that this actually can increase the rates of sexually transmitted diseases because they, these methods of contraception don't always work, basically. Um, maybe from the back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said it, it has a detrimental effect on the cycle as well. Um, how do you see that in probably not in the group? But then at, at what stage or in the future period or at what stage mm. do we have now? Well, I think the church has always uh, uh, required moderation, you know, that we don't overdo it. And I think as a parent, uh, that's, you know, what I, I think with experience of having 10 and, you know, okay, uh, you know, some people who may hear may have had more or whatever, but, you know, uh, I think one has to be measured and patient. And in fact, our traditional priests are extremely good giving advice about the right balance between not being too soft, but being too hard. So there's a perfect medium really so the perfect uh, place in between those two I think the problem I have with some of the studies which show um, yes uh, I was smacked on the hand once and now I'm having post-traumatic stress and I'm you know actually those people it's often other things anyway this is seeing patients myself you know some people you can just breathe on them and they're upset and they're depressed and all the rest of it you know and it's because they're really unhappy people. And I see women coming into my clinics, they've got marks on their arms where they've been cutting themselves, they're pierced all over, you know, they've got tattoos everywhere. And I know before they even speak that they're really unhappy people, mostly, most of them. You know, they have this look, they seek it out because actually they are unhappy people. And they often will say they've had suicide attempts and all that. But of course, they always maybe blame it on parents because that's easy. But I think, you know, clearly there are parents who overdo things, who are too hard, too inflexible. So a good father, and the, the example of the good father is Christ, is Jesus Christ, you know, the, the good shepherd, is that, you know, there are times where you have to be a bit, pull them back by the neck a bit, you know, obviously not do that with your children, but, you know, uh, the sheep, I'm talking the sheep about the sheep, but sometimes, you know, you can be quite gentle and you let things go, you know, you don't everything they do wrong you can't tell them is wrong because they go mad you know so you have to be measured and I think we are very fortunate to have our traditional priests who for myself and for my wife have been extremely helpful because it's very difficult every child is different every child needs to be brought up in a slightly different way even of our 10 they all have completely different personalities so I think it is difficult to know as a parent the best way my own personal feeling is that I would agree in some ways that, you know, if you're doing corporal punishment, hitting the child where you leave marks behind or it can injure them, then I think that's wrong, really, generally. That's my own personal view. But equally, there are times in their life, like when they're two years old, they can't, they can't, they don't, you can tell them, you can explain, you mustn't go near the fire, darling, because it's going to burn you and you'll get a burn and you might have a health problem. But they just don't understand. They can't reason properly. So sometimes a little 
tap or something may just get the message over better, but always with moderation and always trying to do it when you are patient, really. That, but this is, I don't have a lot of scientific studies because they will never be funded, this sort of thing, because <laughs> we're not interested in the truth, they're only interested in... But in some countries, I mean, in Wales, in the United Kingdom, the Welsh Parliament has voted to completely ban all snacking from 2025, I think. And unfortunately, I think this will not prevent any children being severely injured because those parents don't care about the law, you know. I think what it will do is it will be a, an instrument of psychological torture for all parents that they are being watched everywhere they go and anybody who loses patience with their children, they'll be ringing the police. In fact, in my hospital, we had to have training every year, well, brainwashing, I think, to say that if you ever see a parent telling their child off in a harsh way, you must ring the police, you know? And, and I said, this is madness, you know? The police will do nothing else but investigate people who are a bit impatient. And anybody who has a child knows that there are moments where you become impatient. I said to the trainer, I said, do you have children? Oh, no. Right. Well, there you go. How do you choose to teach us? You have no personal experience about this, really. All they're interested in is, you know, anyway, it's be politically correct, but anyway. Sorry, I've gone on a bit too long with that response. That's a really good question, and whenever you say it's a really good question, that means there's, I can't answer it. <laughs> but what I would say is that, I mean, I did choose dermatology and allergology deliberately and, and then not do internal medicine much anymore because there are fewer conflicts in this area, actually. Um, and fortunately, the, like with covering the body with clothes, Actually, the World Health Organization agrees with me, or I agree with them, you know, about that. So that's not controversial, really. So there is always that. The problem is sometimes when patients will ask my advice and you, you know that there's a, a, a religious problem or there's a problem of their soul as well as of their body. And I try, in, in England, and you, it is completely against the law to say anything about the faith. And in fact, there have been doctors who have been prevented working because they have shared their faith. There was a nurse who was fired and struck off the nurse's register because she asked a patient if she would like her to pray for her. So she said, would, would you like me to pray for you? She said, no, that was it. She gets fired because one of the relatives of the woman made a complaint that she was being brainwashed. And you know, we know who's doing the real brainwashing, of course. So, but sometimes you do get the, because you have a very special relationship with your patients. Some patients I've seen like three or four generations of the same family. They trust me, they ask me things. And sometimes I can steer the conversation onto a, well, don't you think that there is more to life? You know, don't give up. Maybe you need to think. And then you try and, and something they say to you, sometimes you can use that. And well, you know, you said you've, and as a child, you liked going to church, and maybe you could think about that, you know. But one has to be very careful uh, because it. To trust your patients in some kind of way. Yeah. Also because when they go to the authorities, then, or to the government, then they yes. tell about this, then you have trust. Yeah, I think it, it could be potentially, and this is the frightening state that we're in. So we're very far from the Hippocrates oath, you know. We're actually. Anybody who doesn't think alike, you're out, you know. And this is why this diversity, all this diversity, diversity. Well, diversity, but not the truth. <laughs> Let's not have the Catholic diversity. Let's have our own diversity. So it's, a very, it's like walking on a tightrope, on a rope, and you've got to be very careful to balance. And 
one tries to help, but there are limits in the law of what one can do, really. But, you know, it depends how much I trust and know the patient as well, of course. Is it possible to not to mention the Catholic faith or that it's for operating the Catholic moral uh, standards, but that you can publish these scientific facts uh, in, in a way that, that it's uh, helping people in a scientific yeah. way to live a good life? Mm. I mean, That's the problem is that these the studies that ask the good questions and the real questions are never funded, and even if they are done, they're never published. It's like with the transgender thing. You know, many people, non-Catholic, non-Christian, who just psychiatrists working with transgender people, people who think they're transgender, you know, and they're saying, look, this is a big problem. You know, these people are often depressed. You know, they often, if you don't, if they don't have a sex change, then maybe five or 10 years later, they, reg they, they are happy that they didn't do it. And equally, there are people who regret having it and have it try to go back, you know, and all of this, you know, it's just madness, really. But these people, when they try to publish their results, the journals won't publish them, the universities won't do anything. And actually, these people often, I mean, there have been cases of people being fired for, you know, standing up for the truth. And it's not because they're Catholic or Christian even, it's just that, you know, the truth is unpalatable. You know, you can't say the truth in some circles. And... The, our universities, and I think Professor Mercier would definitely agree with this, that they are run by a small group of people who think exactly the same way and they don't tolerate anybody thinking outside. I'm lucky because I'm in an area which is not so controversial, really. But equally, whenever I'm talking about allergies, you know, I will mention about allergies to the pill and to other uh, contraceptive methods and so forth. So maybe my little drop you know, into the ocean of the uh, university may do something. But I think the main thing is your personal witness. Whatever I say and can try and convince people with medical arguments, actually the fact that I've got 10 children is the thing that people are like, wow, 10 children? Are you mad? Is it all the same wife? You know, uh, <laughs> you know the Muslims often say, just one wife and 10 children. <laughs> So, but that in itself, because they always, they know, they know that, you know, there's something wrong here. So it's like, but are you Catholic? They often say, are you Catholic? It's like, well, yes, I'm a Catholic. So, I mean, I'm not going to deny it. They've asked me. Oops, sorry. So, um, you know, one does what one can and in a small way, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult then. Yeah. I mean, there have been some studies looking at, you know, primitive diets and, you know, that, you know, perhaps thousands of years ago. I mean, there's always a bit of a sort of an evolutionary tint to that as well, though, which is to be rejected. But, you know, that perhaps maybe thousands of years ago, we were kind of designed to run on fasting for a lot of the time. And this is the point I was trying to make, that actually our bodies were probably designed to be, you know, you have the harvest and you eat more and then there are times where you don't eat more, the weather's not so good, the harvest doesn't work. Or... Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the, even the words are linked, you know, that, you know, uh, so they, they sound similar. So um, I, I, think, I think it probably is the way that God designed us, really. And I think this highly, high diet, high in, you know, um, sugars and other uh, uh, carbohydrates that go th quickly through our system, this is not healthy, you know. So the old-fashioned people would eat maybe more starches and, you know, that sort of thing, but this refined sugar is not really very healthy generally. And, of course, the effects on our psychology as well, so that people get addicted to the sugar high and they've got to have it and they keep going and all the rest of it. So there is a kind of an addictive behaviour with that, as well as other food additives. I mean, I didn't go through this uh, before, but, you know, food additives which, you know, flavour enhancers that we become addicted to. So people are eating the Pringles, you know, they can't stop. And, you know, that's the advert, don't, you can't stop. And it's like, yes, because you're making us addicted to this, you know, and this is not good, really. So. Uh, 
uh, what we certainly know that people who get diabetes, of course, they suffer more with um, you know, dementia and they get strokes and all this can affect mental uh, function quite, quite a lot. So, you know, again, my whole point is that really, you know, if we could follow the laws of the church, we'd actually be healthier if we lived in this sort of, uh, you know, like a medieval society where people were living in the rhythm of the church's year, actually we'd be quite a lot healthier generally. Noch Fragen? What would be your advice for young people who would like to study, become doctor or in the medical area? Um, what are the studies which would not be in adequation with our faith? Well, <laughs> difficult, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, I, and I do have other traditional Catholic friends, you know, who sometimes might have got a God, two godchildren, actually, who are not traditional Catholics, who are studying medicine. And, you know, they still, they do have some, you know, they do have the faith, you know, but they're just not, they're a bit misdirected, really, sadly. Um, but I, I know I would say, you know, be very careful what you, what you train in, because there have been doctors very courageous in the UK who, um, who were Catholic and they decided to do gynaecology and obstetrics. And because technically in the law in England, you are allowed to say, I'm not doing abortions. And in fact, when I was a medical student and later on, when I came and I had to go to theatre to help other surgeons and so forth, I, um, I said, I will not do anything for an abortion. And they were all very English and, oh, that's fine for you. You know, I don't like doing it anyway. I always get somebody else to do it. You know, I've had people say that to me as well. I, I get my junior doctors to do it because I don't like doing it myself, you know, like as if that's any different. But, um, you know, so there have been doctors who've gone into obstetrics and gynaecology and they've found it impossible because they can't do the lists and there's this pressure, you know, and you've got to, well, you've got to see the woman before she has the abortion. Yes, but actually that's kind of being complicit in the abortion. And it just, it becomes impossible. These poor doctors, they actually took the Ministry of Health to court in England saying that no, they're not respecting the, the law. And it was all just swept under the carpet. No, 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 you know, that's just the interpretation and you could carry on doing it and it's impossible. So I think you have to be very careful because what you don't want to do is to do all the training and then find you really can't work at all. But I think there are some areas that are less of a problem. I mean, psychiatry is a bit difficult as well, you know. I mean, we have, obviously we had Professor Bark, who's a clinical psychologist, uh, a professor from, uh, who was at Leuven, uh, and also now at the Maudsley, which is the top hospital in London, and he has survived, but he's found it very difficult. People very critical of him and his opinions and so forth. But I think, and, and of course, when you're doing internal medicine, there's all the end of life thing. You're seeing a lot of elderly people. There's the euthanasia story. I said in England, it's not officially allowed, but of course it happens. And I have refused to do it. And I've had people, patient relatives, offering me money to kill their patients, to kill their relative, you know. And fortunately, I was able to say, this is against the law, you know. But of course, soon, it will not, like it is here, uh, you know, it will not be against the law. And doctors will have no protection at all. So um, it's a very difficult situation. But I would encourage people, if they are, have the interest, have a vocation, to do it because there are in medicine there are many niches you can find so there will always be some way you can find a home for yourself. Aren't we then abandoning the figure of speech in the battlefield? I mean, it's easy for me to say I don't have I'm not in the medical profession altogether. In my work, line of work, I have never faced ethical dilemmas. Hmm. And of course we can say stay away from the fire, which is what you do when you're a parent, yes? constantly worried about the future of my children, although, thank goodness, uh, my faith gives me hope. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, yes, I understand what everyone's saying, but if you want to be a gynecologist, uh, you know, if we only leave those gynecologists to qualify, who say, yes, abortion is not a problem for me, 
Yeah, where does, where does that take us to? I think it also depends where you are in the world as well, because, you know, I think maybe in Belgium, certainly there is the remnants of the Catholic country that it once was, the great Catholic country, which sent out missionaries all over the world. And sadly, now so many empty churches and all the rest of it. But I think, I think there is a bit of a, there's a remnant of Catholic philosophy there. Whereas in England, you know, I mean, Catholics are 5 to 10% of the population. And of practicing Catholics, it's probably 0.01% of the population. So, you know, when I was at medical school, there were lecturers and it was unbelievable, really. And I mean, really, talk about hate crime. You know, it was, who here agrees with the Catholic Church teaching on contraception? We were 350 to 400 students. I knew that there were 20 other people, roughly, Catholics who went to Mass every Sunday. And there was one hand going up, which was mine, you know, every time anything like that happened, nobody else supported me, you know. So everybody's looking round and he's, oh, he's the mad one again, you know. So, um, you know, and people came up to me afterwards and said, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't feel like I just was a bit, you know. You know, and it's like, but then also you have to look at them and say, well, what support do they have? When their priests are saying, keep quiet, when the priests in Ireland for the recent referendum on abortion said, we're not going to say anything, it's up to you to do it. You know, you're not even supported by your priests. Well, then, what can you expect? So I think, yeah, we should all be martyrs and we should all go in there and all the rest of it, but we also have big families we have to look after and we have to kind of feed them and, you know, so I think it, it is difficult, but I think we try, and I'm, I'm sure we all in our work, we try and chip away a little bit at the, the atheist society we live in, really, but... You know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I think it's wonderful when people do, like these doctors, it's so courageous, you know, but they end up with nothing, sadly. But, so maybe they would have been better in a different way, I don't know, it's difficult, but you're right. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Is he Catholic? No, no he just. Yeah. Yeah. But he's actually up but there are people, you know, it's, this is a natural law, you know. Uh, you know, things are as they are, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, and you can say two plus two equals five, but, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't work if you're building a building on that, that mathematics, you know. And I think there are some very courageous people who actually. They have nothing of the faith, but there's this natural law which is inherent. And this, I do not see any con, you know, clash between science, true science, and, and faith, because the two go hand in hand. So it's when people try to pervert, for their own reasons, the science that we get things. You know, and I think there are many courageous people who are standing up and saying this is just ridiculous. I think it's also slightly amusing with that sort of German schadenfreude expression where you see these people who are very trendy and politically correct who are fighting amongst themselves about this issue but women's rights versus trans rights you know and they're just <laughs> and you think maybe they'll just kind of destroy each other and then we can get on with like real life again maybe but um, anyway there's a certain humor in when people are you know criticised Jermaine Greer, a very vocal feminist from the 60s and 70s, and she's being no platform. She's not allowed to talk in universities in, London, in England now because she's transphobic, you know, but it's quite amusing when they get, they get uh, hurt by the same weapons they've used on other people, really, so... <laughs>